like a private lecture, practically. <laughs> Okay. Recording is started. iPad is connected. Yeah, I know. That's my question too. Where is everybody? <laughs> I'm worried that they're like in another meeting or something, but it doesn't look like it doesn't look like there's another meeting. Well, hopefully they either find their way into the lecture or they were watching the recording. <laughs> All right, well, for the people who are here, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to <laughs> Math 115. Um, how's everybody doing today? Are we surviving? It's Thursday, so it's the last math lecture of the week. Don't have to get up early for this class tomorrow. That's nice, right? It's been a short week. Yeah, that's true. We had the President's Day. That's always nice. In fact, after a three-day weekend like that, I almost find like the following week to be more enjoyable just because of how short it is. All right. <clears throat> Well, before we start, are there any questions, um, like administrative questions or anything, uh, I guess, mathematical since last time? OK, if not, then um, let's get started. So as usual, I will start by going back and spending longer than longer than I plan to review whatever we were talking about last time. <laughs> I feel like that's probably why I get behind, but I feel like it's helpful. So let's do it. <clears throat> so I'm not going to review the stuff about the rational expressions and polynomial inequalities, but I am going to review a little bit about exponential functions. So here's what we were talking about. Um, man, my I feel like this board gets really cluttered sometimes. I got to come back and erase stuff. OK, so what were we talking about? We were talking about these guys here. f of x equals a to the x. We call such a function an exponential function. We call it an exponential function because we have the variable x in the exponent, OK? So things like 2 to the x or 1 third to the power x, these are exponential functions. But something like x cubed is not exponential because although there is an exponent, it's not a variable, OK? The variable here is the base. And when the variable is the base, well, we just call that a polynomial, right? Or a power function, if you will. Um, so an exponential function is special. We have the x in the exponent, OK? And then we have a number as the base, and we call that base this number a, OK? So a here is a value, and x here is a variable. So that's how we define exponential functions. And we talked about their properties. We can plug any number that we want into them. For example, we can do negative exponents, no problem. We can do zero exponents, no problem. OK, so we can have a domain of all real numbers and then the range is just going to be from zero to infinity, right? Because we have got to remember when we do those negative exponents, we're not actually going to make the expression negative. All we're going to do is move that base to the denominator and. Change the exponent from being an excuse me, a negative exponent to being a positive exponent. OK, and so that's why when x becomes really, really negative, OK, we actually are going to just see this exponential function. Most of the time it's going to get really, really close to zero. 
okay? And then when X gets really big, if we have exponential growth, then uh, our function is kind of blowing up to infinity, right? It's getting huge. I shouldn't say blowing up, but it's going to infinity, okay? So this is what the graph of an exponential function looks like when we have exponential growth. It looks like as we move from left to right, we start very, very close to the x-axis and we just go slightly up, 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 up. And the characteristic of these exponential functions is they start going up faster and faster and faster and faster. Okay? They start going up faster and faster and faster. And we can plot them by just, you know, make a table of values, plug in some points and see what we get, and then just connect all of this with this kind of general shape. Okay, so the general shape that we want to connect our points with is something like this if we have exponential growth, or something like this if we have uh, exponential decay. All right, so those are the kinds of shapes that we're going to be using, and we're going to use one of those shapes to basically connect the dots on, on one of these graphs. OK, uh, then we had some reminders about exponent rules. I'm not going to review that. Um, that should be pretty well known by now. Um, exponential decay, so that's going to happen whenever our base value is less than 1. OK, so if our base value is less than 1, like 1 third to the power x, then when we like continue to multiply our number by 1 third, the number gets smaller and smaller and smaller as the power x gets larger and larger and larger, which is why we wind up with a shape which looks more like this, where we have actually we're going to infinity on the left side, okay, and we're going to zero on the right side. Okay, so that's exponential decay, right? It's characterized by starting high and then after a while we get very, very small. Okay, so that's that. But yeah, we had a little side note here, which is to remember that if A is actually equal to one, we're not even gonna have exponential decay or growth at all. We are just going to have a constant function, okay? So our A value should be somewhere, sometimes I write this symbol here. This just means in. Uh, is going to be in 0, 0,1 union 1, comma infinity. Okay, and this one is going to give us growth, and this one is going to give us decay. Okay, it's going to be in one of those two intervals, and depending on which one it's in, we'll get either growth or decay. All right. Um, so the last thing that we talked about was how to handle something like a negative exponent, okay? And the trick with a negative exponent is we got to be careful about the way we've defined exponential growth and decay, okay? So the way we defined exponential growth and decay was assuming that we had a function of the form f of x equals a to the power x. Okay, if I throw in a negative sign here, that's really going to kind of spoil what's going on with our function, okay? So what I do instead is when I come across something with a negative exponent, like this negative x here, what I'm gonna do instead is rewrite it in the correct form, okay? I want it to look like a to the power x for some number a, and I want x to be positive. Well, I can rewrite three to the negative x as something with a positive power if I just move that three to the denominator. Right, then it would become 1 over 3 to the x. And that's the same as doing 1 over 3 to the power x. And that's how you actually wind up seeing that this problem was a little bit misleading because it seemed like our a value initially was 3. Okay, but that was sort of a fake out, okay, because we had the negative exponent. So our actual a value is the one that we can write in these parentheses and have a positive x on the outside, okay? We want that positive x power. And that's how we defined exponential growth and decay was we, we assumed that this power x here is positive. So if you see one where it's not positive, make it positive first before you make a judgment on whether we have exponential growth or decay.
All right, so I think that pretty much brings us up to speed. Uh, are there any questions about these exponential functions so far? Questions or comments? How do we feel about the exponential function stuff so far? Pretty good or struggling? Okay, Justin's feeling good. How about everybody else? Okay, Catherine's feeling good. Okay, Abdul Rahman, fantastic. Sam's good too. All right, great. Okay, well then, um, we'll move on. I guess nobody came to my two hour long office hours yesterday, so I just, I. I'm forced to assume that I'm just lecturing so well that everyone understands everything I'm saying. That's a joke for the record. <laughs> okay. Well, let's move on and talk about some new stuff. Um, so I'm just going to just spit some facts at you really quickly. So if we have some exponential f of x equals a to the x, um, there's a couple of kind of useful uh, facts that help us to graph these functions really quite easily. OK, the first thing is for any exponential a to the x, if we plug in x equals 0, we're going to get a to the power 0. And then it really doesn't matter what a is, we're going to get 1. OK, so that's the first fact, which is just to say, really, that if we have any exponential function of this form, we know that the point 0 comma 1 is on the graph of that function. OK, if we have f of x equals a to the x, you can just go ahead and plot 0, 1 immediately. OK, if you're trying to graph it. OK, the other point that we can graph immediately is <clears throat> we can see really quickly that if we plug 1 into an exponential function, we would just get that number a to the power one and any number to the power one is just itself, right? We just get a. So consequently, if we have f of x equals a to the x, we're also going to get the point one comma a is on this graph. OK, so before you even start plugging in numbers and using a table and trying to connect the dots, you can already just go ahead and put 0 comma 1 and 1 comma a on the graph. OK, so for example, if I want to graph f of x equals, I don't know, 4 to the x, what would I do? I would draw my coordinate axes. And the very first thing that I would do is I would put a point at 0 comma 1, and I would two, three, four. I would also put a point immediately at zero comma four. And that's almost enough already to like, you know, start kind of filling this thing in. OK, so I, I know it's going to look something like this. All right, there you go. So that's a really quick and easy way to graph these functions. You just get those two points. If you wanted to be really good, you, you could maybe do like negative one and then find your one quarter would probably be a little bit lower, somewhere like there. And then you could find like two, you're going to be at four squared is like 16. So I don't know, you'd be like way up here. So this one's going to be a little bit steeper than usual. OK, in fact, the larger our A value is, the steeper the growth is going to be. OK, so I guess I'll give that as another fact. If A is less than B, then A to the X is less than B to the X 
for x larger than zero. Let me say that these are both larger than one. So A and B are both numbers which give us exponential growth. And we consider X values which are, why don't I say larger than one? X values which are larger than one. Uh, then A to the X is gonna be less than B to the X. Um, oh, I just said that. A to the X is less than B to the X. So in other words, B to the X grows faster. OK, so this is something like f of x equals 4 to the x, something like f of x equals 3 to the x might grow a little bit more slowly. It might look something more like this. And then something like f of x equals 2 to the x grows even more slowly than that. And so on and so forth. All right. I don't think that's too hard to see. We have a bigger number, take it to a power. It's going to be bigger. All right, so let's talk about exponential transformations now. OK, so this is going to combine basically section 1.5 and the section we're currently doing, which is 3.1. OK, so remember, section 1.5 was when we had all of our vertical shifts, horizontal shift, reflections, vertical stretching, and horizontal stretching and compressing. OK, and I just copied in this uh, table from the book because I feel like it lays things out really well. Um, so let me just kind of go through and remind you what all of these shifts are going to do. Essentially, they're going to do the exact same thing as what they did before. The only thing we have to be a little bit careful about is noticing that the horizontal shift is going to happen when the subtraction or addition is happening in the exponent up here. OK, so a vertical shift is just like before. We take the graph of A of X or A to the X and we add C outside, out back. Then what is that going to do? Well, it's just going to have the result of every single point which was on A to the X gets moved up C units. OK, so if we have plus C out back, then we have up. Oh, didn't want to do that. And we have up C units. OK, that's what we get. Likewise, if we have minus C, then we're going to move down C units. OK. Um, at this point, I think that's kind of familiar. Horizontal shift, the only thing we have to be careful about is that we're going to see this happening in our exponent here, OK? So we see a to the x minus c. In some sense, this is even easier to identify that this is going to be a horizontal shift than it was before, because we don't even have to worry about, like, identifying whether our addition or subtraction is happening inside the parentheses or outside the parentheses. OK, it's actually up in the exponent. OK, so it's in an entirely new place altogether. And that's going to give us a horizontal shift. OK. And the horizontal shift that we're going to have, if we have a minus sign, we're going to go to the right that many units. And if we have a plus sign, we're going to go to the left C units. So it's just like before. It's kind of flip flopped from what you think it's going to be when we are inside those exponents. OK, and then reflections, negative a to the x. This shouldn't surprise you at all is going to reflect us about the x axis, right? We just take the height a to the x and we make it negative, right? That's going to make all of our points flip beneath the x axis. And if we take our x value and we say, let's take not this x value, but the x value which uh, is on the opposite side of the y axis, well, that's going to correspond to a reflection about the y axis. OK, so when we have a minus x with the exponent, that's going to reflect us about the y axis. 
Okay, and then again, vertical stretching and compressing are basically the same. If we multiply the whole graph times C, we're going to vertically stretch the graph of Y equals A to the X if C is larger than 1, and then compress it if C is less than 1. Okay, and then horizontal stretching, it's like the opposite, right? If we do A to the power CX, and then again, we have horizontal compression if C is larger than 1, and we have a horizontal stretch if C is less than 1. Okay, so when we do things either inside or outside of the exponent, okay, we can see that these things are sort of flipped from what we think they're going to be. Okay, so when we add on the outside, we go up. When we minus on the outside, we go down. But when we subtract on the inside, we go right. And when we add on the inside, we go left, okay, which is a little bit backwards. Likewise, if we multiply by something larger than one on the outside, it's a vertical stretch. But if we multiply by something larger than one on the inside, it's a horizontal compression. OK, so these things are sort of backwards when we have things in the exponent itself. So let's do an example. All right, let's graph the function f of x equals 3 to the minus x plus 2. OK, 3 to the minus x plus 2. Well, I could go ahead and make a table of values and, and plug things in, and I would get a graph that looks pretty good. But let's consider this. As a transformation. of the function f of x equals 3 to the power x. And let's list what are our transformations. Somebody help me out. How have we transformed? the graph of 3 to the power x if we now write 3 to the power negative x plus 2. Looks like I've got two transformations to list. Can somebody give me one? OK, not left to remember left is going to happen if I have you're right, though, plus would go with a left. This plus if we had three to the negative X plus two like this, then this plus two would produce a, a shift to the left. But since we have it out back, it's going to correspond to either an up or a down. OK, and when we have a plus with something which is outside of our exponent. Yeah, OK, yeah, cool. Yeah, we're going to move up two units. OK, that's good, though, because now you're going to remember that and you won't make that mistake in the future. I, I always tell students, like, you certainly should not be afraid to make mistakes during class or on homeworks. Like, that is your time to make mistakes, and making mistakes is like 90% of how you learn how to do math. So be proud if you make a mistake or if you're brave enough to make a mistake in class or on homework, OK? That's going to help you learn. OK, so this is going to go up to. And what's my other? Yeah, the other one's reflected about the y-axis. OK, because what this really says is, OK, when I'm at X, I should take the X value, which is on the opposite side of the. So when I'm at X, what I should do is I should take the value which is at negative X. And replicate. The height of the function three to the X at that point. 
over here. That's basically what this is saying to do in so many words. So that's why we wind up with a with a reflection about the y axis when we have a minus sign, which is inside of our exponent. OK, great. So we know what the function. Three to the X looks like. Let's draw three to the X first. Well, it has zero comma one on there, right? And it's also got zero comma th or one comma three on there, right? So if we were to draw it, I don't know, it would look something like this. OK, so let's draw our function. F of X equals three to the minus X plus two. First, we're going to flip it and then we're going to move it up. OK, so here's how I'm going to do that. I'm just going to first I'm going to flip. And then I'm going to move this whole thing up two units. OK, so it did go through zero comma one before, so now it should go through zero comma three. OK. So we flip it about the Y axis and then we moved it up two units. And that's how we got this blue graph. OK, so you don't necessarily have to, you know, draw a table of values for all of these things every time. You can use the fact that you know what some of these look like already. And then just consider this funky looking exponential expression as a transformation of something which you already know. OK, so by the way, if we have this plus two out back, OK, there's something I want you to know, which is that we're going to have a new horizontal asymptote. OK, the new horizontal asymptote is going to be here. at y equals two. OK, so before. Our graph of. Three to the X. On the left side was getting really, really close to zero, right? So if we move the whole thing up two units and reflect about the Y axis, we're going to see that on the right side of our blue graph it's going to be getting very, very close to the value Y equals two. OK, so. This is our new H asymptote at Y equals two, and that is resulting from the fact that we had this plus two here. OK. And just for good measure, let's write out how we would actually express what that asymptote means using limit notation. So let's first determine what is the value, the limit as X goes to infinity of. Three to the minus X plus two. What should go in my blank here? We're going to use limit notation to express the end behavior of this exponential function. So remember, let me just remind you of this notation, what this means. This limit as X goes to infinity, so we take X values which become arbitrarily large. OK, X values which become really, really big. And what we're trying to say is that when X becomes really, really big, the height of the function three to the minus X plus two is becoming really, really close to. Blank. So what is the height of the function, the blue function getting really, really close to? As X 
marches out very far along the x-axis. What's happening to the height of our function? Yeah, it's getting very close to two. Right? And that makes sense too, because you can you can just plug in values, right? Try like try plugging in three to the negative one million or something like that, plus two. Then this number is gonna be very close to zero. Right? And as this number, this as this <laughs> number negative one million gets even bigger this whole thing is going to become even closer to zero. And so the only thing that we're going to have left over is this positive two, OK? OK, this notation is not like mission critical, but I'm going to use it every now and again during class because it's a nice way to express what's happening with end behavior, OK? I'm, I'm probably not going to like, you know, write on an exam some kind of limit expression just because it's not really totally within the purview of this class. But if you move forward with mathematics, you're going to really be happy to have seen this notation before. OK, it's going to really, really help you, and I want you guys to be familiar with it. OK, let's try the other one then. If we do the limit as limit of 3 to the minus x plus 2 as x approaches negative infinity, OK, so now we're going to consider what is happening to the height of our function. What is happening to the height of our function as our x values become very, very negative? OK, we go out in this direction. So we take x values which are extremely negative and we want to find out what is happening to the height of our function. What do we think? Yeah, we're going up to positive infinity. So we can just write infinity if we want, or we could write a plus infinity. OK, my infinities are not very good. I wonder if it'll fix it for me if I like hold it down, maybe. Nope. <laughs> All right, that's the that's the best infinity you're going to get out of me. All right, so yeah, as we go really far to the left, I mean, if you think about plugging in a really, really negative number like try x equals negative 1 million. That would give us 3 to the negative negative 1 million plus 2 equals like 3 to the 1 million plus 2. And this number is huge, right? 3 to the 1 million. I mean, you got to multiply 3 times 3 times 3 times 3 a million times. That number is going to be unbelievably large. And as we increase the x value and we just keep multiplying that number by 3 more times, it's going to get even bigger. OK, so that's why we say that the limit as x goes to negative infinity of this function is going to be infinity. Okay. I'm going to keep working in this limit notation here and there. Um, because it's, it's really quite, quite useful and it's like a very kind of precise way of saying things. The previous way that the book wanted me to do it was say, OK, as X goes to infinity, F of X goes to question mark and we would put we would put two here. Uh, but I mean, that's just like a repackaging of this limit notation and the limit notation is far more standard. So that's why I'm just trying to run that by you guys. OK, any questions about transformations of exponential functions? It's essentially the same process as the transformation of any other function. We just have to remember that, that the sort of inside of this function is in the parentheses, or not in the parentheses, but it's in the uh, exponent. OK, so when we have something being added or subtracted in the exponent that's going to correspond to a horizontal shift or multiplied in the exponent that's going to be a horizontal compression or stretch 
Okay. Well, if there's no further questions, then we'll move on to something else. And uh, we're going to talk about interest, okay? So first we're going to talk about simple interest, and then we'll talk about compound interest, and we'll talk about continuous interest. And then we'll see, we might be done after that. Okay, so let's talk first about simple interest. And uh, the first thing that you should know about simple interest is it's useless to know what simple interest is because nobody uses simple interest to do anything period. So I'm going to lead you through this exercise in futility, but just know that this is not really that important for you to know in life. Okay, but it's going to be, I guess, mildly mathematically interesting. Uh, I guess it, it basically just expresses a fixed growth rate. That's that's all that it really does. OK, so here's here's how simple interest works. So suppose that A of T expresses the amount of money in your bank account after T years, but it could also express something else. It could express like the amount of people in a city or it could express like any other thing that grows with time or decays with time for that matter. OK, so A of T, we're just going to take it to be the amount of money in our bank account after T years. OK, so A of zero is the amount of money in our bank account at time T equals zero, a.k.a. now. OK, so we make a deposit in the bank of. Of a dollar amount, which we call A of zero. OK. And then if the bank says they offer simple interest at an annual rate R, then here's how we find out how much money is in our bank account after T years. We just take our initial amount, which is still in the bank, okay? We never withdrew it. And then we add to that uh, basically a fixed rate times a certain amount of time times the amount of interest or times the amount of my initial deposit, okay? So basically what this says is that this will be like some some number, right? It says that each year. I add into my bank account. A fixed amount of money, which depends on my initial deposit. Depending on initial deposit. Okay. And here R is going to be a decimal expressing the interest rate. Okay. So for example, if, if they offer an annual simple interest rate of 5%, then we take R to be 5 over 100, which would be 0 0.05. Okay. So let's see how this works. In fact, why don't we even do, we'll do one, two, and three years. For, for one, two, and three years. Okay, so we deposit $2,000. So immediately I know that A of zero is equal to $2,000. And a good way to start these interest problems is just to figure out first what everything is and then start plugging. OK, so I know A of zero is two thousand dollars and my R here is going to be equal to. Well, I have a five percent interest, so five percent written as a decimal would be point zero five. OK. Five percent would be point zero five. So my function here, a of t, is going to be equal to a of 0 plus a of 0 times r times t. And here a of 0 and r are known, so I can rewrite this as a of t is equal to 2,000 plus 2,000 times 0 0.05 times t, which would be equal to 2,000 plus no, better get my BA2 plus calculator out. 
five percent of two thousand, like four hundred or something. No, four forty. No, oh, a hundred. Okay, so we get plus a hundred t. So this is just using the formula that we were given, okay? A of t equals a of zero plus a of zero times r times t. So let's see how this actually works when t is equal to one, two, and three years. So after one year, we could compute a of one by doing 2000 plus 100 times t, which is one. So we have 2100. Oops, that's 21,000. $2,100. A of 2, then, is going to be 2,000 plus 100 times 2, which is 2,200. OK, and then A of 3 would just be equal to 2,000 plus 100 times 3, would be 2,300. OK. And you'll probably recognize that this is not ever in the world of investing or banking or anything. This is never how it actually works. Ever. <laughs> okay, but I suppose you could find you could find some uh, you know physical quantities in the world which are going to be modeled by this. But basically, if we were to graph this, what does this look like? This looks like linear growth. OK, we start at 2000. And for every one year. We go up by 100. So what does it look like? It looks like linear growth. OK, that's what it looks like. OK, I call it linear because each time I move over by one, I go up by 100. I move over one, up 100, over one, up 100. OK, that's a fixed rate of growth. We call that linear because we can draw a line through the points. All right. So that's simple interest. We just take some amount depending on your initial deposit and we say, OK, I'm just going to put that in your bank account each year to uh, to increase it. All right, any questions about simple interest? OK, if not, then we'll move on and talk about something actually useful. Compound interest. OK, so this is most likely how your bank computes your interest. OK, so at the end of the year, if you have like, I don't know, however much money in your bank account, then your bank is like, here, have a nickel. <laughs> and they give you like some really minuscule amount that depends not on your initial deposit, but on your current balance, OK? On your current balance. OK, so here's how compound interest works, OK? The way compound interest works is we take your initial deposit, OK, we take your initial deposit, And then we multiply that times this number 1 plus r to the power t. So if r is something like 5%, OK, then this would be the number like 1.05, for example. And we take that to the power t, OK? And as t increases, this 1.05 to the power t is going to increase exponentially. 
Okay, so your money is going to keep growing and the rate at which your money is growing is going to grow, which is great. Okay, now I promised you that this depends actually on your current balance, right? At the end of the year, we take your current balance and we give you interest based on that. And this expression doesn't really look like it's taking having anything to do with your current balance at the end of the year. But watch this. Watch this, I'm about to do something super cool. Not really that cool. Okay, but we could rewrite this in the following way. We could rewrite this as A of zero times. Well, this is just one plus R times one plus R times one plus R dot 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 times one plus R T times. Right? So I can take one off. I'm going to do instead, I'm going to multiply one plus R to the T minus one times and then multiply that times one minus or one plus R. OK, and then you'll notice from the above definition that this A of zero times one plus R to the T minus one, this is nothing but A of T minus one. So at the end of the year, I take your balance from the previous year and I multiply times one plus R to get the balance in the next year. OK. But we can consider that as basically just taking our initial balance and multiplying it repeatedly by one plus R. OK, so that's how it's written in white. As opposed to in pink, we've written it sort of recursively where we take the previous year's income or the previous year's um, balance and we multiply that by one plus R. Or we can just take the first year's balance and multiply it times one plus R a certain number of times. Okay, it's just a different way of looking at things. Okay, so let's see how this actually works. We'll do, again, we'll do uh, one, two, and three. Okay, so we deposit $2,000 and we earn 5% compound interest for one, two, and three years. So I am going to first figure out what the heck is my function. Well, I know A of zero here is going to be my initial deposit. That's 2000 I know that R is again going to be 5%, so it's going to be 0 0.05 as a decimal. And then we're going to wind up with an equation which looks like this. We're going to get A of T is equal to 2000 plus, no, just 2000 times 1 plus 0 0.05 to the power T. In other words, 2000 times 1.05 to the power T. OK, so. Um, let's just plug in, we'll get A of one would be equal to 2000. Times 1.05 to the power one It's just 1.05. So let's do it. 2000 times 1.05. Is equal to. 2100. Then A of 2 would be equal to 2000 times 1.05 squared. So we take 1.05, we square it. Do this on my calculator. And then we multiply that times 2000. And we get 2205. Then A of 3. We take 2000 times 1.05 cubed is equal to, I don't know why I wrote that so far over. Well, we take 1.05 and we cube it, and then we multiply that times 2000, and we get 2315 and a quarter. OK, so what do we notice as we go down this 
waterfall here. So the first step was up by $100. The next step was up by $105. The next step was we went up by uh, $110.25. OK. So we notice that each year, since our bank account has more money in it, we earn more interest, which is great, right? And this is how interest works at actual banks, okay? When you, if you have like a, a savings account, okay? Uh, a typical savings account. Will give. Uh, 0.05% APY, in other words, uh, annual percentage yield. So basically our R is going to be something minuscule like 0 0.0005. <laughs> so in a year, you probably earn like a really tiny amount of in like. Really tiny amount of uh, interest on your bank account. Okay. But if you have an investment um, like in a stock or uh, in a in like a Roth IRA or an IRA or even a CD, uh, you can earn interest at a much higher rate. Okay. Which, by the way, if you're not aware of what a Roth IRA is, it's great. You should look it up. If you start investing now, it's way less work when you're older. OK, that's just. That's not part of our class, that's just my advice to you as human beings. OK. So that's compound interest. Basically, we just take the previous year's balance and we multiply it times a fixed amount, and that's how we get the compound interest. That's how we get our new balance using compound interest. Any questions about how we do that? All right, by the way, this function here, a of t is equal to this thing, this looks like an exponential function, right? It's an exponential function where our a value is 1.05. Here, a is larger than 1. That's going to give us exponential growth, right? And this looks like a vertical stretch by 2000. OK, so these are just exponential functions when we use compound interest. All right, well, if there's no more questions on compound interest, then we're going to move on to the next type of interest, which is, I would say, it's still um, relevant. It is. It is sometimes used. Uh, in, in fact, in some sense, this is maybe more accurate of you know what you are actually going to have happening with say an investment. Okay, because investments their uh, value fluctuates on a you know on a day to day basis practically, or or even a minute to minute basis. OK, so continuous interest is used in the investing world. OK, and uh, before we talk about how to actually use it, we need to talk about the number E. OK, so here's my math meme of the day. Maybe I'll try to include more math memes. In fact, this is even like I'm pretty sure this is a Generation Z meme. I don't know. I'm a millennial. Don't ask me about Gen Z memes. They confuse me. OK. 
Anyways, so E is just a number with uh, <laughs> with very special properties which are outside of the purview of this class. So E has some really kind of nice properties for doing calculus. Uh, in fact, it it has magnificent properties for doing calculus. It's it's honestly mind blowing how special this number is. But all I'm going to tell you today is how we define it. And uh, I'll allow some other person later on in life to tell you why it's so special once you know a little bit more about calculus. So some guy way back in the day was like sitting in his apartment and he decided to kind of explore what is it, what do we get when we take the following limit? OK, so we take some number, which is just for any number n, we take 1 plus 1 divided by n, and then we take that number to the nth power. OK, so what do we get when we take this limit to infinity? OK, so basically we just plug in successfully larger or successively larger numbers. OK, so we plug in 2, we would get 1 plus a half squared. And that would give us 2.25. And uh, if we do it with 10, with this should be n equals 10. I don't know why I put 4 there. n equals 10. We would get 1 plus 1 tenths to the power 10. That's 2.59374. And then if we plug in n equals 1 million, then we get 1 plus a million to the millionth or 1 plus 1 over a million to the millionth power, and we get some number which is like 2.71828. OK, and what this person noticed was really kind of interesting. OK, initially you see this thing and you think, um, well, you know, we're just taking larger and larger powers. OK, so maybe this is going to infinity. But it's not because this number here inside which we're taking larger and larger powers of the number which we're taking the power of is getting smaller and smaller it's getting closer and closer to one and if we take a large power of something close to one well it might not go to infinity it might even go to one but what this person realized was it's actually really interesting this actually uh goes to this number which we call e now it's something like 2.718 something 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 and uh, yeah, here's what I wrote. These numbers are getting arbitrarily close to the number we call E, and E is an irrational number like pi. OK, so E is a number which starts out a lot like this last one here, something like 2.718 dot dot dot. OK, and it's like pi where we're going to have an infinite decimal expansion, OK, with it just numbers and numbers and numbers going on and on forever and never repeating. OK never repeating. So that is the special number E, and that is how we find out what it is. OK, that's a little bit more on the abstract side. Um, so uh, if you're interested in this sort of thing, um, this is what mathematicians do all the time. They just do all sorts of crazy stuff like this just for fun. Um, but if you don't care, then just remember that E is something approximately close to like 2.718 dot dot dot. There's even a number for it on your calculator or button. OK. All right, so the way we do continuous interest and the reason I had to define what E even is, is as follows. So suppose a of t again is going to be the amount of money in our bank account after t years and a of zero is our initial deposit. Then if a bank says we offer interest at a continuous rate of r percent, OK, they say we offer interest at an annual rate r. Then the way we get our new balance after t years is we take our initial balance and we multiply times this number e and then we take the power to be r times t. OK, take the number to be r times t. So let's see how that works. In our case, if we have $2,000 and we're earning 5%, that should say continuous, we're find it earning 5% uh, continuous 
interest rate for two years. Uh, we'll do one, two, and three again. Then how do we do this? Well, again, we've got A of zero is our initial deposit of 2000. R is going to be equal to 0 0.05. And so A of T is going to be equal to 2000 times E to the 0 0.05 T. OK, so all we're going to do is we're going to take that thing and we're going to plug in successively larger numbers. In for T. So A of 1 is going to be equal to 2000 times E to the 0 0.05. And you can use your calculator. I don't know if you guys can even see this on my screen here. No, you can't. <laughs> OK, so you can take your calculator and there should be a button somewhere on it that says something around along the lines of E or E to the X. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to do E to the power um, let's see, e to the power 0 0.05. And I get something like 2000 times 1.05127109. Okay, some long, long decimal there. Okay, and if I multiply that number times 2000, I get my end result which is like 2102.542193, okay? So if you wanted to truncate that, you could just uh, probably get rid of everything after the, you know, pennies place. Okay, and then A of two, what would we get? We would get 2000 times E to the 0 0.05 times 2, which is just 0 0.1, which would be equal to 2,000 times, well, we take 0 0.1, we do e to that number, and then we multiply that times 2,000, and I get, oh crap, I forgot to write down what it is, 0.1 e to the x. Like 1.10517019.18. We take e to that number, we get that, and then we multiply that times 2000, and we get 2210.341836. And then A of 3 would just be 2000 times e to the 0.15. Which I'm just going to do it. We would do 0.15, get the value of e to that number, and then we multiply that times 2000. We get 2323.66. Dot, dot, dot. Okay, so um, what is the point here? Basically, we're just taking this number e and we get. The power, which we're going to take e to by getting our rate times our time. And then we just do e to that number and we multiply that times 2000 to get our new balance. OK, so after one year, we had like twenty one dollars and or twenty one hundred and two dollars. After two years, we had two thousand two hundred ten. After three years, we had two thousand three hundred and twenty three. OK, and what you're going to notice is basically this is like not that different than the compound interest case. OK. In that case, we went 2100, 2205, 2315. With continuous interest, we did slightly better. OK, but these rates here are are basically designed in a way that they're going to be sort of similar. OK, so when you see this rate R and you get like a 5% continuous rate versus a 5% compound rate, OK, they're going to be like pretty close, but, uh, you know, potentially somewhat different. In this case, we earned more money using continuous interest. Okay, and so banks and investments and people who will give you a loan and, you know, all of this stuff, they will try to use these different types of interest 
to make you think that you are getting a better deal than you actually are. Okay. And they might jip you for like, I don't know, <laughs> the difference between 23, 23 and like minus 23, 15. Okay. They got like an extra $8 out of you um, by, by giving you one interest rate over the other. Okay, and so they'll do this to you. They'll they'll also do like gimmicky stuff, like they'll say, "Oh, we offer a daily interest rate or a or a monthly interest rate," and those are also computed in a slightly different way. But what you really care about, so the most important thing, in real life, is that. APY, annual percentage yield, okay? And what this is gonna tell you is this is gonna tell you the adjusted, this is the adjusted uh, interest rate computed as if using annual compound interest rate. Okay, so the APY is going to tell you, essentially, it's going to tell you a, a much better figure that will give you an actual idea of how much your investment will grow in one year. Okay, so an APY will tell you, uh, okay, if I deposit $1,000, it'll tell you how much money you're going to make off of that, okay, in one year. And the way APY is designed is it basically converts everything into uh, equal standing so that you can look at, you know, each of their possible interest rates and see, okay, this one, I have a 5% interest rate compounded annually. That gives me 5% APY. But I see this other one has 5% continuously, and that gives me something more like 5.2% APY. So you would choose whichever one is better for you, depending on whether you're putting money into the bank or you're borrowing. Okay. So look at the APY, annual percentage yield. That is what you want. Or the APR, for that matter, if you're borrowing. All right, any questions about continuous interest? Actually, let me say, are there any in questions about any types of interest that we've covered so far? Or real life investing for that matter. You think we did these in business calc? Have you taken business calc here at UFSC? Wait, what? How did you take business calc and but now you're in this class? I'm confused. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, prerequisite course before 141. Yeah, okay, well then you you definitely ought to be familiar with this stuff. Um, yeah, in fact, you can, you can, you can use calculus to do more interesting stuff with this. Okay, cool. Well, then I guess we'll move on if there's, if there's no further questions about this stuff. Um, but I did want to give you guys just, just, I mean, this general, Thing. I feel like teachers, a lot of teachers or instructors always talk about these types of interest rates, but they don't really tell you what, like, what, what that is supposed to mean for you. Okay, so what I'm telling you is the most important thing for you is to check the APY, okay? Compare different interest rates at different types of interest by using this APY, okay? That's going to be your friend for figuring out which one is better or worse. All right. 
So what is this? This is just a recap on exponential growth and exponential decay. Okay, so the first one we're familiar with. So I'm just, this is just showing you two different forms of exponential growth, okay? So the first form we've already seen, we have just some number times a to the power t where this number a should be larger than one. Okay, so if we have a to the power t and a is larger than one, uh, then we're going to have exponential growth. But we're also going to have exponential growth if we see an exponential function of the following form. If we see e to the power kt, okay, if we see e to the power kt, and k is larger than zero, okay? So k now is not going to be bigger than one. It just has to be bigger than zero, okay? And here's why. You could kind of rewrite this e to the kt. You could rewrite that as e to the k to the power t. And then you could consider e to the k as your a. And you want to know when is a going to be larger than 1? Well, that's going to be when e to the k is larger than 1. And e to the k is larger than 1 if k is larger than 0. Take a power of e, which is, if we take e to the 0, we would get 1. If we take a power which is bigger than that, we're going to get something which is bigger than 1, since e is a number which is like, remember, 2.718 dot dot dot. So e is a number which is larger than 1. So if we take its power larger than 0, we'll get a number larger than 1. And then this number e to the k would be larger than 1, and it would satisfy the first property. OK, so this is just to show you that uh, this is a different form of exponential equations, which we see a lot of the time. And I want you guys to be able to identify whether we have exponential growth or exponential decay just from looking at that form of it without necessarily having to switch into the a to the power t form. All right, um, likewise, exponential decay. Remember from before, this first part is nothing new. We have p times a to the power x, okay, where a is going to be between 0 and 1, okay? Or we'll have p times e to the kx, where we want k to be less than 0, okay? If k is less than 0, then e to the k will be less than 1, and that'll be like our surrogate a value. Okay, so let's do these last couple examples here and then we'll be done for today. We want to identify each function as either exponential growth, exponential decay, or neither. Okay, so let's take this first one. What do we think for f of x equals one third to the power x plus 31? Should we have exponential growth, decay, or neither for this function? Yeah, I think Abdul Rahman's got it. We should have decay, right? We have A is equal to one third, which is less than one and larger than zero. That's the definition of decay, right? This plus 31 is just going to move things up a little bit, but we're still going to have decay. All right, the second one, f of x equals x cubed. This is not even an exponential function, neither. f of x equals x cubed. 1 over x. Again, this is not even an exponential function, neither. 31 times e to the 6x. All I care about is that 6 here is larger than 0. Therefore, we have growth. In this one, we could rewrite this as e to the x times 1 half. And here, our 1 half is larger than zero. So we have growth again. On this next one, 
we have just an A value. Three is larger than one, therefore growth again. Five to the negative X, remember I've got to rewrite that. That's one over five to the X, which is one fifth to the power X. Since one fifth is less than one, this is exponential decay. And this last one here, we've got our K value is negative pi. Since that number is certainly less than zero, we have exponential decay. Okay, so that's how that works. Sorry, I went like one minute over to finish that example up. Please forgive me. Um, anyways, if anybody has any further questions, please stay after class and uh, I can do more examples or you can ask some further questions. Otherwise, thanks for a good week. Have a great weekend. Rest up, study up, and we'll resume next week. Thanks, Heidi, you too.